One of the ways we honor the presence of Jesus Christ, as has just been prayed this week, is by remembering that the son of David, the king of the Hosanna kingdom, went to the cross and came under the judgment of God. But suppose, for the sake of argument, that there is no God and therefore no judge and therefore no final judgment, what meaning is there then to life? This is Quentin's logic in After the Fall by Arthur Miller, in which this character says, for many years I looked at life like a case at law. It was a series of proofs. When you're young, you prove how brave you are or smart, then what a good lover, then a good father, finally how wise or powerful. But underlying it all, I see now there was a presumption that one moved on an upward path towards some elevation where God knows what. I would be justified or even condemned, a verdict anyway. I think now that my disaster really began when I looked up one day and the bench was empty, no judge in sight. And all that remained was the endless argument with oneself, this pointless litigation of existence before an empty bench which of course is another way of saying despair. This is Quentin's argument. If there is no judge, no God sitting as judge, then human existence is a pointless litigation that ends in meaningless despair. I think the Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes would have agreed. From the beginning of his book, he has been saying that if there is no God, then there is no meaning. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We've heard that more than once this year. These are the preacher's first words, and also as we come to chapter 12, his last words. Let me encourage you to take out your Bibles this morning, although the text will also be on the screen. But there's an interesting and obvious connection between how Ecclesiastes opens. We were looking at this at the beginning of the year, I think way back in August, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. But you have the same statement at the end of the book in chapter 12, verse 8. Now, those of you who are Bible scholars or English majors will know that we have here an inclusio, the writer beginning and ending his composition by saying the same thing. This word vanity, you may remember, although it's been a little while now, is the preacher's multi-purpose metaphor for the futility of life in a fallen world. Taken literally, it refers to a breath or a vapor. Think of the steam rising from a warm lake on a chilly morning. Such is life. It vanishes into thin air. Everything is ephemeral. I think the vapor of our existence is well expressed in another play, this one by Samuel Beckett, the play entitled Breath. It lasts a mere 35 seconds. The curtain opens and there is a pile of rubbish on the stage illuminated by a single light. The light then dims and brightens a little before going completely out. There are no words and no actors in the drama, but there is a soundtrack with the cry of a human voice followed by an inhaled breath, an exhaled breath, and then a final cry. It's like what David wrote in one of his Psalms using the same terminology that Ecclesiastes uses, mankind is a mere breath. And by beginning with this claim and also ending with it, the structure of Ecclesiastes reinforces another one of the points of this book, that there is nothing new under the sun. You get to the end of the book, and it's just like the beginning of the book. As it was, so it is now and ever will be. All is vanity. All the time, we end up right back where we began. But I don't think we should believe that the preacher is merely repeating himself. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 8, is bringing us 
back to the place where we began, but we're not exactly the same people. We've read this book, and now we have a bigger perspective on life. And when we come to the end of Ecclesiastes and hear the same statement, it strikes us with greater force. Because now we know, we've read it in this book, that work is vanity. There's nothing to gain from all of our restless toil under the sun. Human wisdom is vanity for a lot of reasons, but here's one of them, that whether we are wise or foolish, we will all die in the end. Pleasure is vanity. We know that. Wine, women, and song, houses and vineyards, gold and silver, there is nothing to be gained under the sun. It's all vanity. Power is vanity. There's no one to comfort the tears of the oppressed. Money is vanity. It cannot satisfy your soul. Then the last of all vanities, which is returning to the ground from which we were made. Dust we are, and to the dust we return. It's all vanity. Not, of course, that there is never any joy. The preacher has also told us to eat and drink and find satisfaction in our work. He's said that there's a time for healing and harvesting, a time for laughing and dancing. He invites us to rejoice in what God richly provides. There is joy in the world under the blessing of a faithful God, and yet the preacher mainly wants us to see how meaningless life is without God and how little joy you will find under the sun when you leave the Creator out of His universe. And I think by the time we get to the end of Ecclesiastes, we have to admit the author really has proven his case. Vanity of vanities, it is all vanity. And I suppose in a way we might expect Ecclesiastes to end at verse 8 with that claim. And yet, vanity does not get the last word, either in the Bible or in the Christian life. Now, Ecclesiastes closes with some further comments that help to set the book into perspective. Now, some scholars will say that the epilogue to Ecclesiastes must have been written by someone else, maybe somebody a little more optimistic. Our own Dan Trier uh, speaks of the authorial ambiguity that we have at the end of this book. You notice in verse 8, it's still a direct quotation from the preacher, vanity of vanities, he says, all is vanity. But in verse 9, there is a shift, and now someone is referring to the preacher in the third person, as if to say, now, you've heard what that preacher has to say, let me give you my perspective. Some scholars even argue that there are two epilogues, maybe even three I was reading this week, one in verses 9 to 11, someone who agrees with the preacher, then verses 12 to 14, somebody who tries to correct him. I suppose all of that is possible. You might have some editorial shaping here, but I think when you look carefully, you see the epilogue affirming what the author said, why he said it that way, and then applying his teaching in a very practical way that's consistent with what we've heard throughout this book. Up until now, Ecclesiastes has told us what the preacher said. Now at the end, the book emphasizes how he said it, verses 9 and 10. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. A number of things are said here about this author. He wrote with logical clarity. He took the time to um, gather together and then evaluate many of the wise sayings that he had heard, and then he included the ones that were weighty enough to demand our full attention. Proverbs like, who can make straight what God has made crooked, which I think we were looking at about a month ago. Not only did the preacher study these proverbs and then assess their truthfulness, but he arranged them carefully. There's a logic to how the book is put together. This is a complete work of literature in which in the opening verses, the preacher states his theme and then goes on to tell us the story of his quest to find meaning in life. And that runs pretty well up through the end of chapter six. 
And then he spends about five chapters showing the difference between wisdom and folly, finally ending up talking about death and dying before coming back here at the end to his primary theme, the vanity of vanity. There's logical clarity here. There's also literary artistry. We're told here that the author sought to find words of delight. What a marvelous phrase to express the beauty of the Bible. Whether people agree with the author of Ecclesiastes or not, usually people don't criticize his writing style. American author Tom Wolfe described Ecclesiastes as the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth, the greatest single piece of writing I have known. This is the book that gave us such marvelous phrases as, the sun also rises, to everything a season, eternity in the hearts of men, when the almond tree blossoms, all of these beautiful expressions. And we praise God for the beauty of this book, not just what the author says, but the way the author says it. Here is the word of God, pleasing the ear, inspiring the imagination, fascinating the mind. The preacher also wrote with intellectual integrity. He uprightly wrote words of truth. And here's a great standard for our own, our own writing, not just writing stylishly, but also truthfully. If there's one thing you can always count on in Ecclesiastes, that is for this author to tell you the truth about God and life in a fallen world. So we have this book, and we've seen it throughout the year, written with clarity, artistry, integrity, but before leaving the book behind, we also want to ask why? What was the preacher's real purpose in all of this telling us about the vanity of life? Well, here near the close, we have a clear purpose statement. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. You have several very significant metaphors here. A goad is a tool of the shepherd's trade, a sharp stick that spurs a stubborn beast to keep moving. Ecclesiastes does the same thing for people of faith. The preacher's words have been pushing us all year, pushing us not to expect lasting satisfaction in money or pleasure, but only in the goodness of God. The preacher has been steering us away from foolish rage and mocking laughter. He's been spurring us on to patience and contentment and joy. And just when you forget that you are mortal and think that you will live forever, here comes the preacher of Ecclesiastes poking you in the ribs and reminding you that one day very soon you will die. This is the goad of Ecclesiastes. The book uh, also compares the preacher's words here to nails firmly fixed. Not, and here we have to be careful not to let our imaginations run away with us, not a prophecy of the crucifixion here, but it is an image of permanence and fixity. When you have a wise saying that is driven into your mind and heart, it stays there like a nail that is pounded into to a block of wood. Biblical Proverbs, including what we've read in Ecclesiastes, have a way of nailing us right in the conscience and sticking in our brains. And there are a lot of Proverbs like that in Ecclesiastes. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happen to them all. You hear sayings like that, you remember them. And all of these Words, these wise sayings that are nailed into our hearts and in many cases goad us into some kind of action, they are given by one shepherd. Maybe this refers to the preacher. He's identified himself as king over Israel and Jerusalem. In the ancient world, kings were often styled as shepherds, but I think much more likely God himself. That's why the word shepherd is capitalized in some modern translations. This is the first time that the title shepherd has been used in this book, and I think that distinguishes the shepherd from the preacher. It doesn't so much identify them as distinguish them. And furthermore, as you well know, shepherd is one of the noble titles for God in the Old Testament. It's in Psalm 23. It's at the beginning of Psalm 80. God is called the shepherd of Israel, our own 
Nick Perrin, in a fine article on the messianic claims of Ecclesiastes, points out that this particular wording, one shepherd, occurs elsewhere in Ezekiel. And there, very clearly, it refers to the coming Messiah. And that's the expectation that the readers of Ecclesiastes would have had when they read this book. I think that puts the entire book into perspective because it makes it clear that these are not merely the musings of some skeptical philosopher, but they are part of the inspired and infallible and inerrant revelation of Almighty God. The shepherd of our souls wants to use this book to prod us into spiritual action. And that has even greater force when we remember that our shepherd has become our savior. The book of John refers to Jesus as one shepherd, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And when we remember that, we recognize that the words we read in Ecclesiastes are also his words. He's the one calling us away from the vanity of life without God to find joy and meaning in his grace. That's why it's sometimes pointed out that there's a difference when you read Ecclesiastes between living under the sun, S-U-N, and living under the sun, S-O-N, the Son of God who is that shepherd who loved us and gave himself up for us. Now, there are a couple of very practical things that that shepherd wants to say to us at the very end of this book. One of them comes in verse 12. Surely you're familiar with this verse. I mean, you're Wheaton students after all. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Uh, yeah, I thought I could get an amen for that. This was true already in the ancient world. The ancient libraries in the royal courts were full of various kinds of books and manuscripts. Uh, back in the, at the end of the 17th century, just to give one example of people who have complained about this, the mathematician and philosopher Gottfried Leibniz complained that the quote-unquote horrible mass of books would consign every author to, quote, the danger of general oblivion. That was in the 17th century. Today, more than a million new books are published every year. And it's happening with digital information, too. Just to give one little experiment this morning I got online, if you search information overload on Google, you get 16 million hits. It would probably take you a lifetime just to study information overload. It's true. Of the making of many books, there is no end, and studying even some of them might wear anyone out. Now, that's not to say there's not a place in Christian discipleship for the life of the mind. That's not the point here. But we should remember that human wisdom is limited. How many books have been written, how little most of them can teach us about the knowledge of God. You can spend your whole life seeking for answers and never finding the truth if you left God out of the picture. C.S. Lewis aptly illustrates this in The Great Divorce by describing a man from the suburbs of hell who has spent his whole life seeking for truth, at least that's what he claims, and he has managed to wander near the borders of heaven, and by the gracious invitation of God, he is invited to enter. But the Spirit warns him, I can promise you no atmosphere of inquiry, for I will bring you to the land not of questions but of answers, and you shall see the face of God. But the man isn't ready to let go of his quest. He wants to study some more books before he accepts anyone else's conclusions. And so he says, we must all interpret these beautiful words in our own way. There is no such thing as a final answer. The free wind of inquiry must always continue to blow through the mind. But the Spirit of God corrects the man. He says, listen, once you were a child, once you knew what inquiry was for, there was a time when you asked questions because you wanted answers and you were glad when you had found them. And the Spirit invites the man to come to the place of answers, and yet sadly he refuses. He says he has put away childish things, and the conversation ends when he suddenly remembers that he has an appointment, makes his apologies to the Spirit of God, and hurries off to join a discussion group 
in hell. I wonder, are you still seeking for spiritual truth? The writer of Ecclesiastes would invite you to end that quest and surrender to the God of all knowledge. Trust Jesus, the good shepherd, even before you have all the answers. Don't be like the person that Paul warned Timothy about, always learning but never able to arrive at a knowledge of truth. This is one of the reasons why the preacher here tells us to accept these words, not to take words beyond these words. Be content with what the scripture gives you, the promises of God. Don't accept anything less than that and don't demand anything more than what God has given. Well, we've heard what the preacher has said, how and why he said it. How should we respond and how does this book end? What is the final analysis? Listen to this ethical and eschatological conclusion. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of humanity for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, this is not the first time that Ecclesiastes has told us to honor and revere God. He's told us, for example, that we should fear God because God demands holy worship. He said that we should fear God in times of adversity as well as prosperity. He said that if we do fear God, it will go well for us in life. Here is another reason to fear God, because one day every one of us will stand before him for judgment. And if that's not a good reason to fear God, I don't know what is. One day God will expose every secret sin and uncover every anonymous kindness. He will bring every deed to judgment, whether good or evil, including every casual thought and every careless word. The scripture says he will bring to light things now hidden in darkness. He will disclose the purposes of the heart. Ecclesiastes has said this before. After all of our days of questioning, at the end of our spiritual pilgrimage, we arrive at the throne of eternal justice and we meet the great judge. And the preacher is saying it again here at the end of the book, I think, for this reason, because it means that everything matters. The preacher began his spiritual quest by saying that everything is vanity. In other words, nothing matters. Without God, there's no purpose or meaning to life. And you may remember, if you have a really good memory, back at the very beginning of the book, the preacher was asking the question, is this all that there is? Isn't there more to life than the things that I see under the sun? Because if there isn't anything else, if there's no God and therefore no final judgment, it's hard to see how anything we do really matters. But if there is a God and if he is the final judge, then everything matters. This is not all there is. There's a God in heaven who rules the world. There's a life to come after this life. The scripture promises that the dead will be raised, that every person who has ever lived will stand before God for judgment. And when that day comes, it will become clear that everything anyone ever did or said or thought has eternal significance. It will matter how we used our time, whether we wasted it on foolish pleasures or worked hard for the Lord. It will matter what we did with our money, whether we invested it in the kingdom of God or spent it on ourselves. It will matter what we did with our bodies, the things that we saw and touched and spoke. What we did for a two-year-old will matter, the way we made time for her and got down on her level. What we said about someone else's performance will matter. The sarcastic comment or the word of genuine praise, the proud boast and the selfless sacrifice, they will matter. The household task, the homework assignment, the the cup of water, the tear of compassion, the word of testimony in the name of Jesus, all of these things matter. The things that you do today and the things you don't do today, these things matter. That's the final word here in Ecclesiastes, not that nothing matters, but that everything does. What we did, how we did it, why we did it, 
It will all have eternal significance. Everything in the universe is subject to the final verdict of a righteous and omniscient God who knows every secret. And if that is true, I happen to think that what matters most is the personal decision that each of us makes about Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes ends with a word of warning, not a message of grace, but it is in the Bible to point us in the direction of the promise of the gospel. If God will bring everything to judgment, it is desperately important to know that we will be justified on that great day. And the way to be sure of that is to entrust our lives to Jesus Christ. He's the only one who has power to save us from the wrath of God. And we remember that especially in Holy Week, that our Savior did not stand distant from the vanity of this fallen world, but entered in, into all of the futility, into all of the frustration, and did more than that because he took the judgment we deserve by dying for our sins on the cross. And having received that judgment, he suffered the consequence that Ecclesiastes says falls to, to sinful humanity, and that is that his body returned to the grave. But on the third day, he rose again and came out of that grave with the power of eternal life. And the thing that will happen next, the big thing that will happen next in the story of salvation is that that same Savior will come again. He will come on the day when the scripture says God will judge the secrets of humanity by Christ Jesus. The Bible says God has fixed a day. You see it again and again in scripture, this specific promise of a day of judgment. Acts chapter 17, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When that day comes, everyone who believes in Jesus will stand face to face with a righteous judge, but will also fall into the arms of a loving Savior. And my prayer and my hope and my blessing for you this morning is that the victory of Jesus Christ will deliver you from the vanity of sin. You are dismissed.